okay, I feel pretty crappy that I didn't wear a wig. And I said, a note. It's like, all right, would I be a total party pooper if I had? And she said, you can do whatever you want. Yes. 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 Helen not wearing a wig. She's a speaker. But Shelly Irwin told her she had to wear a wig. <laughs> So I'm feeling like the worst sport, but I have one. <laughs> I do want to say something about the comments said about Guild this Club because that really is what this community is about. Um, last this week at a luncheon, I heard uh, saying that if if you want to travel fast, travel alone. If you want to travel far, travel with others. And I think that is exactly what this event is about, what the four organizations that come together, the fifth and the other organizations that are out there, and the sponsors responding to the call to support this community. That really demonstrates what you value as well. So thank you, thank you for all of that. When we were starting Gilda's Club, we visited other Gilda's Clubs in the country. And here's what we learned, that the Gilda's Club in Detroit was started by um, all the people from Gilda's Synagogue. The Gilda's Club in uh, Florida was started by a number of transplants from Detroit. The Gilda's Club in Chicago was started by the owner of Second City as well as a very wealthy philanthropist. They were not nearly as successful as, we, as we've been and because we made a conscious decision from the very beginning that we wanted it to be community owned. And that meant making sure we had an inclusive board, that our fundraising efforts were inclusive, that we called on every contractor, every asphalt, uh, drapery making, upholster, meal provider, and gave them the opportunity to support the club. So when we opened, the first day when we invited people that had participated, um, the craftsmen, we have over 250 people for lunch, but they all have their fingerprints on Gilda's Club. They all own it and continue to own it, which is why we are the most successful one in the United States, and also because of an incredible dedicated staff. They could certainly be doing other work, but they see this as their calling and give back every single day. That's what makes this community the community that it is and the community that makes it really easy to get involved. And when people said, wow, how did, you, how did you do that that fast? Well, all you have to do is ask. And I think all of us know that. You know, it's easy to not participate when <coughs> someone asks. And it's something that's compelling you to play a part. Um, I was thinking, yes, I am a uh, five-time cancer survivor, so. <laughs> friends over that will be here tonight. We drank wine. I made appetizers because I'd love to be busy. And um, I was pretty calm. And people said, how can you be so calm? And part of it's denial, certainly in the first couple of days. But um, I have a sister, Denise, um, who's also a friend and was diagnosed with cancer. I thought she was younger, but I used to say tonight, 27. And we had a nine-month-old daughter. And you know, talk about back then. There was no support for uh, <coughs> breast cancer. Uh, there was, let alone, services for someone that young. So she worked full time, raised this child, wore a really, really ugly wig that was very <laughs> difficult to keep a straight face when she said, <laughs> just look okay. so, so whatever comes back to me, I, I totally deserve it. But the good news was she survived. So my first, and it was a happy ending. So my first experience was a, was a positive <coughs> one with, with cancer. When people talk about um, what have you learned, well, I think most of us in this room, and I know there are a number of cancer survivors in this room, there has to be. There has to be almost everyone that has had somebody that they have worked with, cared for, loved, that has been affected by cancer. 
Um, and we all know, if I were to ask everyone in here, when have you learned your best lessons in life? It probably wasn't around a promotion or it wasn't around a new house. It was probably going through a divorce, losing a parent, um, not getting the job you wanted, being laid off, that we tend to learn more through our losses than we learn through our pains. And so how do you take those experiences? Even today, I was thinking as I started radiation this morning, so I'm kind of dating up here. And um, I was thinking, I have to go every day for 28 days. Isn't that awful? But then I started thinking, what if I lived in Cedar Springs and I had to come down the East Belt Line for the next 28 days? What? What if it was a polar vortex? Imagine what that must have been like for people to try and, and make a life creating appointment for them on time. When I saw the pictures of the Bahamas, what did all those people do that were going through radiation or going through kidney dialysis? Um, what are they doing now? Imagine the helplessness and the hopelessness. So what I really learned is I'm a person of privilege. You know, I, as well as all of you, you wouldn't be here tonight if you're working that second or third job. And we are the 1%. We're the 1% in terms of income. We're the 1% in terms of education. We're the 1% in terms of networks that we have, of people that can help. And it's a humbling experience. And you know, I sat next to people that couldn't afford the uh, $1,500 shot, or it wasn't covered by their insurance. People that couldn't afford these magnificent wigs, or couldn't afford breast reconstruction or couldn't work part-time, still be paid full-time, but had to go right back to their, to their jobs. That it's not a level playing field. I have great docs that I've had for a long time because I've had consistent insurance. I've had great benefits from, from my employers. So at the end of the day, it was sort of like, okay, I'd love to have a pity party, but I'd be really struck to come up with too much that I can really whine about. So maybe that's where all my wine came in. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't talk to others about it, but but the, you know the other lesson that I learned during this is, um, you know, I think for and I look around the room and I see obviously a few strong, very brave and competent men, and a few politicians running around here. Um, but as women, you know, my, when I was first going through treatments, I remember saying to a nurse oncologist, I said, you know, my biggest issue is when people ask to help, I want to do it myself. You know, the old, I am woman, hear me roar, I am strong, I can do, I can do everything. And she looked at me, and with just deadly seriousness, she said, Deborah, do you realize every time you deny someone the opportunity to help you, you are denying them the opportunity to express their humanity? It's cool. Well, I'm Catholic. I experience deep guilt. This weekend, I was watching a movie with my 10 year old grandson, and there was a scene where a girl was going through a tough time, and she got a knock on the door, and it was a friend. And the friend said, can I help? And the girl said, no, I don't need any help, and closed the door. And my grandson said, oh, isn't that awful? We all need help some of the time. If my best friend Grant told me no, my feelings would be so hurt. And I thought, you know, out of, out of base. So I think the lesson for any of us going through any challenging time is to learn to, and I think I've gotten really good now with five times, um, <laughs> learn to accept help, learn to accept it gracefully, and then the biggest obstacle or opportunity is learning to actually ask for help and tell people uh, what you need. And for those of you that find yourself as a patient, uh, you gotta help people out too. You know, people would say to me, what do you, what, what do you need, what do you need in my early diagnosis? And I had to come up with something or, heaven forbid, I would get way too many casseroles. <laughs> so one time I said, you know what, I love OPI nail polish. Give me a bottle every week with a funny name. 
um, trashy magazines. I don't want to buy them at the store. We'll buy them. <laughs> <laughs> or the friend who's going to be here tonight, I'm sorry she's not in this room, that she and her husband dropped off a six pack of beer and a couple pounds of kielbasa. <laughs> that is go. meaningful to me. And, you know, or people that help me clean out my trashed uh, storage area in my basement, Sue. Um, that's that. What do people want, and how can you help? And so, as a person going through something, accept the help with grace. And for those of you that are trying to help, even an awesome little card in the mail that tells somebody you're thinking of them and praying for them really helps as, as well. Um, the, the other thing I would like to add. So. When I think about a saying that I've heard that I really love, and it's like, if you were charged with helping to improve the lives of others, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And I think every day, as all of us with privilege wake up, we need to ask that. And it doesn't have to be big things. It doesn't have to be a huge check. Of course, any one of these four organizations would love a huge check. Uh, it can also be volunteers. It can also be uh, doing legislative work that needs to be done. There are so many ways that you can help. So I hope my experience has helped me see different ways that I can support others. And it's really, it's really been the best thing and the worst thing that has ever happened to me. And as I've said to the people at Mercy Health, you have given me some of my best shitty experiences. <laughs> <laughs>